You know, to tell you the truth, a lot of us guys back then, we knew very little about it. I unwrapped this M14. Wow, I mean, M14, brand new. The only hands that touched it, I was like a kid. I was excited, you know? And then I heard the other means, we're going to war. I say, what war? I was ready to be transferred to my last year of duty at Treasure Island, which would have been just a joy. But President Johnson at that time decided he needed 50,000 combat troops. We got on the ships. In the middle of the night, the ships turned course. We said, what's going on? And the captain of the ship told us, we're going to go training in Okinawa. Then before you know it, we were on ships sailing for Vietnam. I thought, oh my God, we are in, what's that place called then? <laughs> Operation Starlight was the first major battle and regimental size clash between U.S. and enemy forces during the Vietnam War. Over the course of six days, between 18 and 24 August 1965, units from the 3rd Marine Division, 3rd Marine Amphibious Force, clashed with the 1st Viet Cong Regiment. These are the guys that uh, just waxed the French at Dien Bien Phu. I mean, these were, these were some pretty special guys in their minds anyway. They had defeated the French, the Vietnamese, and very arrogantly, they were going to come up and take on the Marines. And they were not afraid of us. They knew what they were doing. They were all, they were all seasoned troops that we were fighting. They were good men. For the first time, the Marines left the defensive enclave they had been ordered to man since landing in early March and carried the fight to the enemy. The morning that we loaded onto the Jolly Greens, as they told us, more than likely going into combat, and basically there was no civilians there. If we found anything, it was kill everything that was there. Recognizing a threat to the base at Shulai and an opportunity to destroy an imported enemy unit, General Walt immediately set in motion a major operation. We did a surprise attack on them, decided to attack them rather than let them attack us. The amphibious landing force was to be the 3rd Battalion, 3rd Marines, and the 2nd Battalion, 4th Marines. They would land by helicopter behind the beachhead at established landing zones named Red, White, and Blue. The operation plan called for 3rd Battalion, 3rd Marines to land on Green Beach, overwhelm the enemy at the beachhead, and press the remainder west and north. 2nd Battalion, 4th Marines, landing by helicopter, would destroy the enemy in their path and pushed the remainder east and north. So it was called the hammer and anvil would come in this way, where another unit would be over here, and we'd try and get the enemy in between us. The planners envisioned that the two battalions would meet at a phase line designated Banana, and push any enemy still on the battlefield to the coast, where they could be trapped and destroyed by supporting arms. After a short ride, the tractors nosed up on the beach dropped their ramps, and the Marines landed, two companies abreast on Green Beach. It was there where we really got uh, some heavy weapons fired. We got about 10, 10 15, 20 yards inland, and uh, an explosion took place, which was the VC had set up a big charge in the stone fence. Two junior Viet Cong officers had organized a small force to fight a delaying action. Lieutenant Bert Henson rallied a squad of Marines and led an attack that burst through the lines of resistance and got things moving again. The whole battalion got uh, bogged down. Had one squad that was not pinned down, and that's the squad that uh, we assaulted the hill with. Meanwhile, helicopters from Marine Medium Helicopter Squadron 361 ferried Marines to the battle. Golf Company landed without incident in landing zone red and began moving east. Echo Company and the battalion command group was next, setting down in landing zone white. When I looked down, I saw uh, VCs coming out of spider holes. I said, oh, and they were running in that direction. I said, wait a minute, our guys are getting slaughtered over there. So I showed them my M14. I said, there's VCs down there. And sure enough, more VCs were coming out of spider holes. We started shooting them. And finally we were told, <laughs> To advance, I, I said to myself, I don't know if that's a good idea. What if this thing's booby trapped? So as we go down, and we forgot about the spider holes, as we begin to advance, well, as we cross over, we were being hit from the rear. The spider holes, they were coming back, and they were shooting us from the rear. So it, it was, we were being shot from every angle. I mean, you know, 
These guys thought to kill us. It was a different story for a hotel company under the command of Homer Mike Jenkins in Landing Zone Blue and was a hotbed of enemy resistance. Lieutenant Jenkins had two objectives, Hill 43 and the village of Nam Yen. And I landed right beside the village where their headquarters were. We were totally surrounded. We took, uh, started taking fire from all four directions. My squad was no sooner off the chopper and uh, one of my guys fell down. I went over and picked him up, carried him over at the dike, and he died in my arms. My company, in two different ways, we were totally surrounded immediately. And we were supposed to take the village. When well, we got into a trench line, and all hell broke loose. So we attempted to fight our way out. And no matter which, what we did, we just kept getting clobbered. We get rid of one thing, we try something else, and we'd be right back in the soup again. We were being overrun. My machine gunner, Ernie Wallace, he, he held off the Viet Cong as they were coming in as we got away while the mortars were walking in. One of the senior sergeants was shooting the dead people and the captain said that this was inhumane and to stop and he did and at about the time he did one of these dead people turned over and he had a grenade. He threw the grenade at, at him and this was when the captain was killed. When it became obvious that Mike Jenkinson's hotel company was not going to take the village of Nam Yan 3, he was ordered to return to LC Blue and set up a defensive perimeter. You know, I'm the, the commander and I'm asking the troops how, how we can defend ourselves tonight. We're going to do just what John Wayne would do. We're going to circle the wagons. So it was 22, 24, something like that, in that wagon train standoff, and we stayed in those positions all night. There was very little fighting after sunset. Most of the enemy who were still alive filtered out of the battlefield and toward the western mountains. And then in the morning, at first light, here comes tanks crashing through to us. So we got on the tanks and they pulled us the hell out of there. It has often been said that no plan survives the first contact with the enemy, and Operation Starlight was no exception. The operation was, however, a resounding success. They were, they were the greatest bunch of guys that ever lived. They were uh, a real good bunch of Marines. If you have a Marine next to you, they will take care of you. They will always be faithful. It is the strongest brotherhood that I can think of. I'm getting goosebumps. I'm proud of it, very proud of it. Always faithful to another Marine. He gets in trouble, he knows he can pick up the phone and say, hey, Ben, I need some help. I'll be right there. To me, Marines will always be Marines. We are a brotherhood and we stick together, thank God. That's the backbone of being a Marine, Semper Fi. Every Marine believes it the same way. And the Marines is part of my life. And I, I've never had nothing better happen to me than the Marine Corps. Who do you really fight for? I love this God, country, core. No, it's the unit, the guy. You fight for the core first. God may come second, the country can come third, but you fight for the core.